Say amen again. God is good how often and all the time. Find somebody close to you this morning and say, neighbor, God loves you. And I do too. And if you love me as much as I love you, then nothing can break our love in two. Amen. It's always a blessing to see so many that have come out on this morning. Praise God. I was joking with Marissa. I said, Lord, look at all these folks here this morning before 10 o'clock. Ain't God good? Ain't God good? Ain't the Lord good? Let's keep that up. Amen. Praise the Lord. Let's praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. So good to see everyone that is here um, on this morning. As always, we bless God for those of you that are watching us via live stream. We're always just so thankful of all the places you could have stopped by. We're glad that you're here with us this morning. We pray that you have your copy of the Word of God. You'll follow along with us and that you'll be blessed by the things that are said and done here on this morning. Um, everybody come to hear a word from the Lord this morning. Amen. Amen. I believe you came to the right place. We'll be in Genesis uh, chapter 49 um, this morning um, for our consideration. And verse number 19 is where we'll get our scripture text um, from um, this morning. I need the oh, oh, I need the chapter 49, what you will find are the last words of Jacob. Jacob called his older sons to his bedside and he tells them about the days to come and he issues some prophetic words about the future of each one of his children. In verses number three and four, the first three sons were rejected from being able to be in the messianic line. Reuben, which was Jacob's firstborn son, would have been the most natural candidate for the job, but he had disqualified himself by defiling his father's bed. Verses 5 through 7, we get Jacob said of the next two brothers, which were Simeon and Levi, that they were men full of anarchy and full of violence, and that they would not be able either. In verses 8 through 10, God had chosen Judah, in spite of all of his failings, to be the father, the father of the line of kings that will lead us to the person of Jesus Christ. And then we have in verse 13 that Zebulon would live by the seashore and he would be a harbor for ships. Then we read about Issachar and how he would not fare well during the return to Canaan. And we read about Dan, how he would be a judge of his people. But I want to focus this morning on verse number 19. And verse number 19, the Bible reads like this. Gad will be attacked by raiders, but he will attack their hills. In the King James Version, it said, Gad, a troop shall overcome him, but he shall overcome them at last. Amen. Amen. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart, the Lord, be acceptable in thy sight. Pray with me, if you will. Father God in heaven, it is indeed we are grateful. We're grateful, dear Lord, for one more opportunity that you have blessed us with this day. Father, somebody came seeking you this morning, Father, and I pray that they would find you. Somebody came bared down with the cares of this world, Father. I pray that you would lighten that load for them. 
Somebody here this morning has a strange relationship with you at this time, Father. I pray that their relationship will be made better. And Father, if you grant us these petitions and prayers, we'll be so ever mindful to glorify you and to give you the praise. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Let all those that love God say, Amen. Amen. Gad, a troop shall overtake you, but you shall overtake them at last. I want to look, I want you to look at somebody to your left or to your right this morning and just encourage them this morning and say, in the end, in the end you're going to win. Gonna win. Hey Amen. That wasn't the right one. Find you somebody else this morning. <laughs> and look at them like, and look at them like you serious and like you mean and like you seeing it for yourself. In the end, in the end you're going to win. Gonna win. <laughs> I want you to see in Genesis chapter 49. And this is what it says in verse 19. It says, Gad, G-A-D, Gad, a troop is going to tramp upon him. I love this, but you shall triumph in the end. There's going to be a reason, season when he is going to be trampled down and he's going to look like a loser. But really what the father is saying to the son is that in the end, you're going to win. And in the end, even though momentarily it's going to look like the dream is finished, your life is not going to be anything worth celebrating. It's going to look like the truth has trampled you. And in the, we would say trampled you down to the ground. But the end, in the end, you're going to be victorious. In the end, you're going to win. This was Jacob's, as I said, last conversation with his sons. And if you read in the context, it actually closes out by him leaning on his staff and dying. So he calls in his sons at this time. He had 12 sons that would become what we know as the 12 tribes of Israel. And Jacob begins to speak over each one of those, which I love this because the father is giving his children not only their identity, but he's also giving them their future. And he speaks words that are powerful, something for them to live up to, something for them to remind themselves of concerning their destiny when things got tough. And he gets to this boy named Gad and he says, son, it's going to look like a troop is going to trample you down and everybody will pretty much write you off. But in the end, you're going to win. You are born, he's saying in so many words, you are born not to lose, but rather to win. I love that. I love the fact that the Bible says that he called. They called for the sons of Jacob. Now listen, this is very important. That the sons of Jacob, and then it says, and they heard the voice of Israel. You remember, this is two people in one body because Jacob was Israel and Israel was Jacob. You know that, right? All right, remember, God changed his name from Jacob to Israel. Jacob means to be a what? A supplanter. It means to be a thief or a cheat or a liar, a no good person. That's what it means. Jacob, but Israel means to be a prince with God. And you remember when Jacob wrestled with God and God said, no longer shall you be called Jacob, but your name shall be called Israel. And what's interesting is they called for the sons of Jacob, but they heard the voice of Israel. The same man with two different experiences. The old Jacob was a liar. He was a cheat. He was a thief. But when God got finished with him that same day became Israel, a prince with God who had power with with God and favor with man. And the voice of Israel was the one that influenced them. Your earthly father may have been an alcoholic. He may have abandoned you. He may have walked away from you. But we all have a spiritual father. And he says, I'll never leave you. And neither will I forsake you. And I love the fact in a fatherless generation, what a model for us to see that fathers and parents can speak identity into their children and give them their identity and paint for them a picture of what their future can be if they remain faithful to it. And God says, I'll back that thing up. He wanted to give his son's identity and he says, a troop will come over you and seemingly defeat you, but in the end, you're going to overcome. In the end, you're going to win. I'm going to tell you who you are. I'm going to tell you where you'll be. When he was born at birth, his mother saw the very same thing. And she said, I'm going to name him Gad 
which means a troop is coming after him. A troop coming. In other words, all she saw was the negative stuff that was going to come against him. But Israel said, or Jacob said, I'm not going to leave it right there. Yes, you're going to face a lot of setbacks and a lot of kids, and it's not going to be easy for you, son. I'm just telling you the truth. He said, let me tell you how it's going to end with a troop traveling you down to the ground. In the end, you are going to overcome. There will be times of severe struggle, but in the end, child of God, Praise God, you are going to win. In the end, you're going to get back up again. You were born to overcome. Look at somebody and say, you were born to win. Dad, you're going to get down, but you're also going to get back up again. You were not born to be defeated. You were not born to be depressed and discouraged permanently. You were not born to be destroyed by the things that come against your life, whether it's abuse or whether it's addiction, whether it's a stronghold. You were not meant to be destroyed by that stuff, but whether God has given you power to overcome I'm not denying, church, that temporary things will seem to triumph and seem to trample you, but I'm telling you that is not meant for you. That is not your future because it is not the end of your story. You were born. You were not born for failure. Boy, I want this to get into somebody. Internal talk matter. What you say to yourself matters. I ain't talking about what everybody else is saying. What you say to yourself matters. I may not be talented enough to you, but I'm more than talented enough for myself. I may not be good enough for you, but I'm more than good enough for myself. You may be insignificant to others, but in the eyesight of God, you are fearfully and wonderfully made, says the Lord. And so when you get in those times when it looks like you're losing, you have to remind yourself of what God has already said. There will be times when it feels like you can't put one foot in front of y'all feel like that sometimes? That you can't put one foot in front of the other. There will be times when you feel like, what's the use of even trying anymore? My dreams are smashed and demolished and it feels like they are trampled to the ground. But he said that you are not born to be defeated. You are born to win and I'm giving you something for you to live up to. I don't want you to get your identity from TikTok. I don't want you to get your identity from people that are living fake lives in Hollywood. I don't want you to get your identity from a game system. I don't want you to get your identity from a protest group. I'm going to give you your identity. I got a powerful destiny for your life and they're not going to give you your identity. You say, well, my daddy left the house and my earthly father was terrible and, and I didn't have anybody that spoke good words to me. I, all I ever heard was, you're nothing, you're nobody, going nowhere. Well, you got a spiritual father. And here's the powerful thing in John chapter one and verse number 12, to as many as received them, to them he gave power to be the sons of God. I don't care who your earthly father is. If you believe on him, I'm talking about Jesus. He says, you are now my son and I'm going to give you your identity. You ought to praise God this morning for the truth of God's word that I am not born to lose. I am not born to be a failure. I may fall from time to time, but praise God, that's not the end of the book. It's just the close of a chapter. If you hold her on just a little while, when God gets ready for the next chapter, what you thought was lost was actually for my gain. John, John in 1 John chapter 4 puts it like this. Whatever or whoever the King James says is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. What he is saying is that if you are born of God and God has spoken your identity, and it's not an identity of the past that makes you feel like a loser or maybe even your present that feels like that you're being trampled, but he's calling us to higher things. 
We were not born to quit church. We were not born to give up. A righteous man falls seven times in a day, but what does he do? He rises right back up again. And when you have a righteous spirit, it's defined by not how many times you fall, but how many times you get back up again. I love the fact that he said something else about winners. What he said in Deuteronomy chapter 33, we're told that the tribe of Gad was there. And God speaks a blessing. And he, and, and he says, blessed is he who enlarges Gad. The word enlarge means to help or to assist into the inheritance. God said winners have to be enlarged or encouraged is another word. Help assisted in certain times, especially when they're low. And he says, if you want to be blessed, learn to be an encourager to people who have a destiny on their life. That when they're talking about giving up, you don't get down in the pity party with them. But rather you grab them down in the middle of their mess and you pick them up out of what they are going through. That's not what God says about you. You can't give up. I'm not going to let you give up. I'm not going to let you lay in this addiction for the rest of your life. You're not going to sit here in oppression for the rest of your life. You're going to get up and be who God has called you to be. Jeremiah 12 said that if you can't run with the footman, and if you run with the footmen and they weary you, how are you going to contend with the horses? In other words, this is not a negative statement. But if you are giving up, if you are talking about giving up when the footmen are coming, that's foot soldiers. There were foot soldiers and then there were horsemen. You know, they, they had a great advantage back in the day. They didn't have guns, so you know, the footmen were discouraging them. And God said, Jeremiah, if you are discouraged by the when the, with the little stuff, and you are discouraged if the footmen weary you, then what are you going to do when the horsemen come? And we all, almost sometimes make that a negative statement. But what God is really saying is the footman level is not what I called you to. I called you to bigger things. You have no idea how great things could be. And if you're giving up over the little footmen, you won't be able to handle the big things that are coming your way. Now, I, now we ought to learn, and we learn, we get to a place in our life after God has brought us through some stuff that used to bother you don't bother you anymore. Things that people used to say that used to be able to damper your spirit. It doesn't damper your spirit anymore because you've gotten to a place to where you realize that the stuff that you are focusing on really don't even matter. Tell somebody it really don't even matter. When you get to where you need to be, church, it becomes a different thing. The horsemen are coming after you. But really, it's encouraging because God says... You're not staying at the level of the footman. Yes, Why are you freaking out at that level when where I'm taking you is bigger because you were born to win? Yes, First Chronicles says something else that's powerful. And, 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 and somebody say winners are encouragers. Winners are encouragers. And, 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 and winners are not just encouragers, but understand this. Winners need encouragement. The second thing I want you to notice in 1 Chronicles 12 is God says the Gadites shall be men of war for battle. And he said they shall have faces like lions and feet as swift as deer. He gives them the description of a winner. And he says one of the ways that a person will know that you are a winner, get this, is if you got the face of a lion. I ain't talking about look mean. I ain't talking about walk around looking, you know, like you want to beat up somebody or jump on. That's not what I'm talking about. A lion is a predator. And his eyes are not. He didn't have one eye over here and one eye over there like a deer. He has his eyes in front. And that, that's all oh, you got preacher, get out my sermon. I'm talking about laser focus. See, winners, children of God, you got to have some laser focus. 
You can't be distracted by everything. You can't be deterred by the noise of this and that and all of this and that. But this one thing that I reach for the prize of the high call and of the upper call in Christ Jesus. I have a destiny and I can't let all of this and that distract me. If you want to sit over here and be worried about the little things, I'm going to keep my mind focused on what God has planned for me. Laser focus, laser focus. You can't get your eyes all down here worrying about what's going on down here. Looking unto Jesus who is the author and the finisher of our faith. So my question is, what are you focusing on? You set your eyes on the prize for the joy that was set before him. Jesus endured the cross when he was in his torture season, when he was being trampled, when he was being spit upon. He carried the cross, but the Bible says his eyes weren't all down here listening to every criticism and every lie that was told about him because he said for the joy that was set before him during his crucifixion, he was seeing the resurrection. It's not going to end here. I may die, but one day I'm going to get up again. I may have to suffer right here, but in the end, I'm not going to lose. I'm not going to have failure. In the end, I'm going to win. In the end, I'm going to win. He said, he said, so, so the second thing it says is that his feet are winner. His feet are swift as a deer. What do you mean? He leaves swiftly. Yeah, some of us in some situations now, we need to leave swiftly. Oh, he moves quickly like a deer. What does that mean? Joseph is a beautiful picture of a winner. How is he a beautiful picture of a winner? Joseph had a magnificent dream. But Potiphar's wife had a spirit of adultery. Tried to get him in bed. She said three times, come in here and lie with me. My husband's on a business trip. Come in here, lie with me. Lie with me, lie with me. She seduced him and tricked him to come in the bedroom. And I'm sure she had all her biblical dress. <laughs> but lo and behold, she wanted to show him everything. And you know, the Bible said that he ran and he got out of there. And she ripped off his coat. Poor guy left his coat behind. His brothers ripped his coat off. He couldn't keep his coat on for some reason. He lost two coats, but in the end, he held on to his dream. He lost two coats, but in the end, he held on to his dream. You might go through a season, church, of losing stuff, but if you follow God, you'll hold on to the dream, and in the end, tell somebody, I'm gonna get my coat back. <laughs> he got his ring of authority back. And all the boys and all the corn of the world, he owned it. But he had a test with a woman in a room somewhere. That bedroom, when he acted like a winner and had feet like a deer. You got to know when to get out of that church. Amen, light bulb. You got to, Bishop, you got to know when to get out of there. Some things pop on your computer, you got to learn how to exit up out of there. You go somewhere, somebody start putting out powder and stuff, you got to know how to get up out of there. You go on a date, you thought he was going to pay, he told me he left his wallet, you got to learn how to get up. You thought he was saved, but he was just saved from the head to the waist, you got to leave him where he at. Get in the car and call an Uber if you have to. Get up out of there. The greatest danger to winning is found in the story of Gad. What do you mean, preacher? Gad associated and teamed up and started camping out for 40 years in the wilderness with a tribe called Reuben. And this is the prophecy over Reuben from the father the same day that he spoke to Gad. Reuben 
You're my firstborn, my might, and the beginning of my strength. He's speaking now. He's saying these things should be in you, my might and my strength, the excellency of dignity, the excellency of power. In other words, boy, you are loaded with incredible, incredible potential. But watch the next verse. You are as unstable as water. And because of your instability, you will not excel. Lord, he's talking about us. He talking about us. Another way it says it like this, that a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. Some of us right now, we're worried why we can't get ahead. Are you going to make up your mind? You're going to serve God or you're going to serve the world? Are you going to make up your mind? Are you going to be real? Are you going to continue to be fake? You got to make up in your mind what you're going to do. He's speaking now, boy, these things should be in you. And it's in you because I'm your daddy. But because of your ways, you are not going to be able to excel. Now, what does he mean by saying that his son is as unstable as water? Water is unstable because water changes in whatever atmosphere it gets in. If you put water in a cold atmosphere, a freezing atmosphere, what's going to happen? It's going to turn into ice. If you put water into a warm atmosphere, it turns to liquid. It can turn to steam. It becomes like the environment that you put it in. And he says, son, you got too much potential, but you are as unstable as water. If you would just be who you are, and then if they don't change, get on their feet and get up out of there. But you got to have laser focus to do what I'm calling you to be able to do. You gotta have something in you. You got to stay encouraged and you're gonna have to learn even when you can't get encouragement from somewhere else, how to encourage yourself in the Lord. Here's the point. The greatest danger to winners is hanging out and associating with the wrong folk. Because when Gad who is full of potential and born to win. When he started camping out for 40 years, everywhere the camp was set up, Reuben and Gad stuck together like Judah and Benjamin stuck together. Every time one of, a, one of them kind of had partners of tribes, they stuck together more than the others of the family. But they stuck together those two. Now, listen, and when it came time for Israel, to cross the Jordan River into the promised land. The Bible said, and we preach and we tell people that all the children of Israel came across. That's not what it says. Two tribes stayed on the other side of the river and never went into the promised land. Guess who they were? Reuben and Gad. Reuben said, I like it over here. Let's settle here. This is good, but that's not what God is calling you to. That's not God's best. And Gad, because of your tight association with Reuben, the greatest danger to a winner is who you associate yourself with. Because negative people will make you settle for less. Dream thieves, that's what I call them. Dream thieves will take away what God has called you to be because they'll convince you that you're not able to do it. Who you associate with is critical. I'm preaching better than y'all letting on. He said, he said, I want you to win, but you're not gonna win unless you stop hanging around the wrong folk. Lord, why can't I be blessed? Who you hang around with? Lord, why I can't get ahead? Who are you associating with? Who you hanging out with? Everybody ain't good company. The Bible says that evil companionship. Oh, I'm going to change him. I'm going to change him. Well, I'm just trying to be a good influence. I'm just, trying, I'm just trying to show them the way. 
I'm, I'm just trying to show them the example of Jesus. And they ain't never heard you say the word Jesus, let alone try to live like him. We use that as an excuse. And instead of us being who God has called us to be, and that is going into the world, trying to transform lives, trying to shape lives for the call of Jesus. He told us in his word, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. So many of us trying to appease, we're trying to conform in order to get people to like us. But I know at the end of the day, if you don't like it, I got to shake the dust off my feet and keep on going. If you don't like it, it's still the word of God. And this is what's going to judge us in the last day. Who you associate with is important. Who you hang around with is important. Who you listen to. Everybody can't give you advice. Everybody can't speak into your life. Be careful who you ask to pray for you. The fo I'm being real with the folk you asking to pray for you need prayer themselves. I can't ask you to pray for my deliverance when you stand in the need of deliverance for yourself. All of us as children of God ought to grow to a point to where I ain't got to call you at 3 o'clock in the morning to ask you to go to God on my behalf. But I can get down on my knees and I can call on my father. I can tell him about my worries, about my trials, about my care. And in the end, I'm going to win. Give the Lord a praise if you believe that in the end. In the end, I'm going to win. So even if you, good God, even if you are here this morning and you're struggling, whatever you're struggling with, don't be, don't feel bad. We all struggling with something. If you're struggling to get off drugs, guess what? Keep on struggling. God going to give you the strength that you need to be able to deal with it. If you're struggling with alcohol this morning, got to have a drink for everything. Keep on hanging in there. After a while, God going to give you deliverance. God going to let you out. God going to bring you through if you keep on holding on to him. But you can't want to quit and hang around what you're trying to get rid of. If you are a negaholic, you need to stop hanging around negative folk. Some of us negaholics. Every good thing we got some bad to say about. It. Either because you didn't think of it, you didn't come up with it, and because you didn't come up with it, you don't want to support it. But at the end of the day, if it's a good work and it's something that's going to further the kingdom of God, I put my hand in. I put my feet in, Lord, I'm all in. I want to do what it is that you have called for me to do. Thanks be unto God who causes us to triumph. Thanks be unto God who causes us to triumph. You know I can't secure victory for myself. That's why I need God. That's why so many people been struggling for 10, 15 years with the same struggle. We call them strongholds, something that got such a strong grip on your life that you just can't get rid of it. Something that just got such a strong grip on your life that you can't let go of it. But child of God, I came to tell you this morning that if you would get out of your mess, if you would get out of your struggle, and if you would lift up your hands before God, if you would surrender your life to him and say, Lord, I cannot, but Lord, I know that you are more than able to do it for me. God will give you deliverance that you're standing in the need. Thanks be unto God who causes us to triumph. It may look like it's going down a bad end, but guess what? In the end, I'm going to have victory. In the end, I'm going to be victorious. The word cause means assigning blame. For manipulating the outcome 
And isn't it good to know that before I got to the situation, God had already manipulated an outcome. Before I ever got in trouble, God had already manipulated. He had already caused a favorable outcome to happen for me. And I want to encourage somebody this morning that may feel like I'm trying, I'm doing all that I can, but it seemed like I can't win. I'm putting forth my best effort. I'm putting my best foot forward, doing all of all that I know how to do, but it seemed like I can't win. Seem like, man, every time I get out of one thing, here come three others that I got to deal with. And I got to ask you a question again. If you get weary by the foot me, what are you going to do when the horsemen come? What are you saying, preacher? The level that you are struggling with right now is just mediocre to where God is taking you to where you're going to end up in life. And if I'm struggling right here, apparently I need to learn something with what I'm going through right now because what I'm dealing with now is only going to be intensified as I go up to the next level and the same God that was with me at the bottom is going to help me to succeed when I get to the top. In the end, Gad, Gad, your very name means that a troop is coming after you. Folk are coming after you to try to overtake you, to try to destroy you. But he said, boy, even though I know all of that, I want to let you know in the end, you're going to overcome. In the end, you're going to succeed. And I want to let you know, all of us, all of us got our own troop after us. All of us. All of us got our own circumstances that are hounding us down. We got our past continuously knocking at our door, trying to remind us of who we were and where you've been and what you were involved in and how you were entangled in this. And you're running from all of that stuff, trying to get away from it because you feel like you're being overtaken. You feel like you're going to drown in a sea of despair. But I came to encourage somebody this morning that they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. You're going to mount up as wings like eagles. You're going to run and not get weary. You're going to walk and not faith. Keep walking with Jesus. Keep holding on to his hand. Keep trusting in him. Keep believing. Keep persevering. Keep pushing. And in the end, what's going to happen? In the end. In the end, he says. In the end, he says, you're going to win. But here's, here's our problem. Here's our problem. We try to process situations while we're still in the situation. You can't process and evaluate a situation while you're still in the middle of it because all you see is what's going on around you. But faith says, even though I'm in this right now, I know that after a while, God is gonna bring me up out of this thing. Faith is the substance of things that we hope for and it is the evidence of things that we cannot see. I can't see a way, but I know after a while, God gonna provide a way. I'm gonna be able to sustain and I'm gonna be able to stand. In the end, in the end, you're gonna win. Son, I'm not, I'm not going to fill your head with all these dreams of having a wonderful life, of bliss, and how everything is just going to go so wonderful. I know somebody lied to you when you got saved and they told you, oh, child, it's just all going to be wonderful. Everything just going to be peaches and cream. Life just going to be a crystal stair. Everything going to go how you want it when you go how you want it to go. But you realize quickly that life does not go like that. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivering them out of them are. I'm going to experience some things in this life but the blessing is at the end of it I'm going to be victorious I'm going to win so keep on struggling how you struggle 
Keep on going through how you're going through. Don't be weary in your well-doing. Don't be, because this is our problem. Just when we're on the brink of it, we throw it in the towel. Just when we're right at the door, here we are. Oh, I can't make it. Oh, I can't do it. But again, if you can weary now, stop asking God to take you to a next level. If you can weary now, stop asking God to advance you and this and that. Because the more you advance, here come the horsemen. Here come greater trials. Here come greater battles that you have to face. And having done all to stand, you got to keep on standing. Stop, stop allowing the situations of life to dampen your faith. And to cause you to in some ways doubt the power that God has. My God can do all things. The Bible says that he can do exceedingly and abundantly above all that you even ask for things according to the power that worketh in us. And I'm so glad that even in the day and time that we are living in, as I said, you may not have ever had anybody there to tell you it was going to be all right. You may not have ever had anyone there to tell you you can make it. You may not have ever had anybody there that when you made a decision that you shouldn't have made, that they didn't beat you down and bury you right there. You may not have had anybody to give you some encouragement to say you can keep on going, that this thing right here does not define who you are. But even though you may not have had anybody in the physical to tell you that, we have a God that is continuously telling us, you can do it. You can achieve it. You can get out of it. This is not the end of it. You can make it over. In the end, you're going to have victory if you can hold on. Amen. Yes, Lord. If you can believe in me, yes. put your faith in me, yes. trust in me. And I tell you, church, eyes have not seen, yes. nor ear heard. Neither has it even entered into the heart of man. The things that God has prepared for them that love him. Gad, how can you allow a certain future to leave you? Because you couldn't leave certain people. How could you miss out on a promised land? Because somebody else decided that this was better. But that was not what God has promised you. Stop listening to people more than you listen to God. If God said something, that's it. You don't need to go get no more counseling on it. You don't need to go get a second opinion. You don't need to go see with nobody else. If God said it, that's it. Trust in God. Realize everything that God does ain't going to make sense to you. Truth be told, majority of it that he does, it don't make sense to you. But he says, you know what? I, I'm not. I'm not commissioning you to understand. I'm commissioning you to be obedient. Amen. I want you to follow me. I want you to be obedient. I want you to submit yourself to my will and to my way. And I trust you. Trust me when I tell you in the end. You're going to win. If you trust me, if you believe in me, all of us, one of these days, if we remain faithful, we're going to win. We might have been sidelined a couple times in this life, but guess what? If we remain faithful unto death, we're going to win. We're going to get the ultimate victory. We're going to win the ultimate championship one of these days. When we stand before a just God, and he recalls all of those things that we've done in this body, this life, those things good and bad, and he recalls those things up before us. I don't know about y'all, but I look forward to hearing these words. Well done. Well done. Good and faithful servant. I didn't say perfect, but I said good and faithful servant. I didn't say you made it all the time, but I said good and faithful servant. And because you've been faithful over a little, come on up a little higher. And Sister Crop, he's so good, he gave us a mansion. I'd have been happy with a single wife. Yeah. Well. He 
of Ephron, he could have gave me one of the utility sheds over there on Grace Boulevard. I'd have been satisfied. But he told me that he loved me so much where I get it from. He told me that he loved me so much that he said, I'm going away to prepare a place for you. I'm going to get it ready. I'm going away to prepare a place. Y'all, he's been working on that thing for over 2,000. You talking about something bad? You talking about something laid out? You, I mean, when you come inside, I'm talking about you got to, I'm talking about when you come inside, you got to take your shoes off. You got, man, you coming up with, because the place where you standing, holy ground. It's holy ground. When you in God's presence, you right up there. Coffee. The place where you stand. This is holy ground. He told me, say, you know what? I'm going to prepare a place for you. Oh, and when I come again, I'm coming again. I ain't going to send nobody after you. I'm coming to get you for myself. I'm coming to get you for myself so that where I am, I don't want you to get lost on the way. I don't want you to get lost in the journey. But where I am, you may be also. Whether I go, you know, and the way you know. Thomas said, Father, we don't even know where you're going. How can we know the way? Jesus said, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No man can come to the Father. Except he come by me. God got a way. You can't get over. God got a way. You can't get under. God got a way. You can't get around it. You got to come in at the door. You got to come in at the door. So he says, Come unto me, all ye that are weary and heavy laden. And guess what? I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For I am gentle and lowly in spirit. And guess what? You're going to find rest for your soul. I don't know about y'all, but sometimes alone, this weary journey that we get in, sometimes your soul get weary. Sometimes your spirit get a little worn down. And that's why you got to go before Jesus. Lord, I can't do it. Lord, I can't do it. Lord, I, I can't make it. Lord, it's getting hard for me down here. Lord, my, my strength, my strength is leaving me, Lord. It's failing me. Lord, I'm trying to serve you. Lord, I'm doing the best that I can, but it seems like that old devil just every time I try to get up. Every time I try to put one foot forward, Lord, here come that old devil bringing back stuff up in my path, reminding me of this and reminding me of that. Devil, I don't live there anymore. I got a new address in Jesus Christ because he whom the Son has set free is free indeed. Beloved, this ain't the end. This ain't the end, beloved. I came to encourage you this morning. It ain't the end. This, this, ain't, this ain't the end. This ain't the end of your marriage. You may be having a rough period, but guess what? Hang in there. Trust God. Believe in him. He'll give you the strength that you need to carry on. You're struggling in a relationship with your children today. Guess what? It ain't the end. You may just be having a rough patch, but guess what? If you hold on to God and if you trust him, God will bring all those things that are not. My Bible said that he causes those things that are not as though they already were. Whatever you're struggling with today, I know a man that is able. I know a man that is able to help you with what you are dealing with. It's not by accident that you stopped by here this morning. No, sir. No, sir. It's not by accident that you came this way. No. God knew what you were standing in the need of. God knew what you needed to hear because God's been walking through this journey with you all the while. Yeah. And he wants you to try, don't give up. 
Stop throwing in the top. Every time you get faced with a situation, you want to give up and you want to tuck your tail and run. But God said it there. If you'll just persevere. If you'll just, I'm so glad that Paul, after he had got stoned at Lystra, I'm talking about you got folk throwing bricks and boulders at you, trying to kill you. But you know what he did after he got up? He went right back into the city and continued to do what God had called him to do. I'm so glad he didn't give up. And if a man that got stoned almost to death didn't give up, what excuse you got? What excuse do you have that's good enough to stop trusting God? I'm talking about the same man. Jairus' daughter was at the point of death. Jesus came and he rose up from the dead. I'm talking about when his friend Lazarus, the one whom he loved, had laid there dying. Jesus didn't even go when they first called him. Jesus waited just a few days. Because he wanted to let them know the same power that I got can raise him up on day one, around day three. Guess what? I got the same power around day three. Look, if he would have waited a whole year, he had the same power to raise him up from the dead. And the same God that did it back then is more than able to do it right now if you are trusting him. God said, God said, God said, when, when did I not show up for you? When? Give me an example. When did I not make a way? When did I not put food on your table? You might not have had but three dollars to put in your gas tank, but guess what? It got you the way you needed to be. And I made sure that what you had was enough to hold you over until you got something else. When, when did I not do it for you? When did I not make a way? Don't give up on me. Don't, don't start down now. Don't give up right now. This is just level one, boy. If you hold on, man, I'm telling you, eyes ain't seen. Ears ain't heard. If you're sticking here with me, I want to encourage you this morning. Keep hanging on. Keep trusting. I know. I know it seems like, man, I'm trying all I know how to do. I ain't getting nowhere. Keep trusting with God. And in the end, a troop is coming after you. A troop is coming after you for what purpose? To overtake you. To take you out. To do away. Simon. Satan has desired to have you. But I've already prayed. Isn't it good to know that before I go through it, my Savior has already prayed for me. Isn't it good to know before I'm ever faced with it, he's already prayed for me. And if he prayed for you, let me tell you, you've been prayed for. And after a while, God's going to bring all those things to pass. Yes. If you trust in him. Yes. Beloved, again, it ain't by accident. God wanted you here this morning. Amen. You came in here today and you don't know the Lord in the pardon of your sin. That's why you're here this morning. Amen. If you are here today and you are already a child of God, but you're struggling to live the life that God has called, he sent you here this morning. Amen. Because God is not willing that any should perish. But he desired all to be able to come to repentance. Amen. The Bible says that Christ Jesus came into the world not to condemn the world, but he came to save. He came to save you, my brother, my sister. He came to get you out of your mess, out of your condition. He has provided a means, he has provided a way for you to be saved. Yeah. So who are you to leave this world and say, I was never told? Who are you to leave here and say, I didn't know God has prepared the way for us. And I'm so glad that we as a people were not an afterthought of God, but we were a first thought of God. God predestined us, not meant that we were predestinated to go to heaven or hell, but he predestined us. God had a plan set in motion before the foundation of the world. He knew we were going to be no good. 
He made us. He knew we was going to have some things about us that we were going to fall short. So God provided a means. God provided a method for us as his people to be brought back into fellowship with him. And I'm so glad that he thought enough for himself to come down through 42 long generations. To come down a nine month long train named the Virgin Mary. To be born in a manger. To suffer and shame. To do all of the things that he had done. Only to be brought to a place. To where when they were given a choice between him and notorious murder by the name of Barabbas, they said, kill Jesus and give us Barabbas. And he went to the cross of Calvary, hung, shed, bled, and died for your sins and for my sins. And he promised us that that was not the end. But one day, I'm coming back. Just like he said that he would. Can y'all imagine what a day it's going to be? But when he step out on that cloud, y'all, and calls all things, when that day comes, y'all, that's why he said, let the wheat and the tail grow up together. Harvest day is coming. One day when I come back, I'm going to do the separating. I know who real. I know who putting on. I know who trying to serve me. I know who's putting forth effort. I know. And because I know when I come back, I'm going to separate the right from the wrong. I'm going to separate it. And the dead in Christ. That ought to put fear in your heart. It ought to put trembling in your spirit. To know that when he come back, he's calling you. He's calling you. Judgment going to begin, first of all, he says, at the household of faith. And if judgment begin first with us, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? So what you playing for? Stop playing. Y'all already see folk getting up here every Sunday telling you how 20 and 30 year olds losing their life in a pandemic. And yet you still walking around here like you got all the time in the world. Like you got all the days in the world to make the decision that today that you hear his voice. Pardon not your heart. He's calling you by name this morning. Come and I'll make a difference in your life. If you need the Lord this morning, you know what you need to do. Come to him. Don't put off today for what you plan on doing on another day. This is the only opportunity that you got. And what good would it have done you to came up in here, did all this hollering and shouting that you've been doing, and leave here the same sinner that you walked in? What good? What good is it going to do you? Oh, we had a good time today, but you still in sin. Oh, I gave the Lord a praise, but you still don't know how to love nobody. Still don't know how to treat nobody. We got to get it right. Don't wait till Jesus come to get it right. Too late. Too late, my brother, my sister. He's calling you this morning. You know within yourself whether or not you have a right relationship with God. Ain't nobody got to tell you what you need to do. Look within yourself this morning and ask yourself, am I right? Jesus. And if that question is anything other than yes, you need to come to him. If you're standing in the need of salvation this morning, you're not yet a member of the body of Christ, which is the church of Christ. You come by hearing his word, Romans chapter 10, verse number 17. So then faith come by hearing, hearing by the word of God. After you've heard it, believe the same. After belief, repent of your sins. Repentance is a change in your mind. That produces a change in your action. After repentance, you confess with your mouth the sweetest name known to mortal tongue. And that is that Jesus Christ is the son of the living God. Be willing to join him in the watery grave of baptism. Have your sins washed away, eradicated, never to rise before you in this life and neither the life that is to come. And the Lord himself will add you to his body. If you stand in the need of prayer, come, let us pray for you this morning. The prayers of the righteous, the Bible says, they are there this much. So don't stand there this morning. Don't sit there like everything is okay if you know it's not okay. The altar ought to be flooded this morning with people that recognize that they stand in need of salvation. 
and they stand in need of help that only God can give. So my brother, my sister, I urge you, do what you need to do. Come to Jesus now as together we stand and sing the song of invitation. Hold on, it'll be all right.